Now, if at some point I stop preaching, it's not because I lost my place or I'm forgetful. It's probably because my eyeballs have or are frozen. So I'll need just someone to help me thaw out, okay? All right, now it is that time of the year where we're getting chilly. It is that time of the year where things are getting spooky out there. It's right behind me, there's, or behind you, there's the Gibson's pumpkin patch and you see little kids over there running around and playing. And it, this is the time of year where we think about Halloween and some spooky stuff. So, you know, I have some spooky things here for you. I, I had a, 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 good, a good friend of mine bring some of these to church. These are not mine, FYI. And here, here's some things you might see around Halloween that's kind of scary. I, I hope the camera gets that. This is a pig's head. Okay, some of these are a little more popular. This is from the movie Scream. Some of you have watched that before. And then my personal favorite, Jason Voorhees, always wearing the hockey mask. And then probably the most terrifying of all. You remember this guy, William Shatner? You remember him? Well, there's a lot of scary stuff around this time of the year. I did some research on haunted houses and they have came up with what they would consider the most terrifying haunted house in all of the United States. It's called McCamey Manor. Now, to actually get into this haunted house, you need to do some things. Like first, pass a physical exam. And then you have to have a background check. You also have to have a phone screen. screen, And then there is a 40 page waiver and a drug test. And according to the website, if all of that goes according to plan, participants have to watch a nearly two hour documentary featuring every person who has attempted the haunted attraction in the past two years. Congratulations, Seth, that's your Christmas present. So now that we've thought about, and our minds are thinking about things that are scary, I'm gonna be reading from the book of Mark because we encounter somebody that's kind of scary. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your smartphones, turn to Mark chapter five. And they came to the other side of the sea. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. And constantly, day and night, among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and gashing himself with stones. And seeing Jesus far from the distance, he ran up and bowed down before him, crying out with a loud voice, saying, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out of this man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And the man looked at him and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to entreat him earnestly, not to send them out into the country. But there was a pig herd of swine feeding there on the mountain. And the demons entreated him, saying, Send us into the swine, so that we may enter them. And he gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down in the steep bank into the sea, about two thousand of them, and they were drowned in the sea. And their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. And the people came to see what was happening. And they came to Jesus, observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. 
and those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they had began to entreat him to depart from the region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was entreating him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home for your people and to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done to you. And he left and began to proclaim everywhere what great things Jesus had done. Father in heaven, we give you thanks. Even in this difficult word, in this difficult passage, that's so timely. We pray that you would be the star of the sermon because you certainly were the star on this day. May the words that I share be faithful to the scriptures and may you open up our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So before we get in the sermon, there are folks that read things like this, whether inside the church or outside the church, and there really are two camps, unfortunately, two extremes, when we think about things like demons and angels. And camp number one is things like that just don't exist. I can't see them, I can't smell them, I can't touch them, so they're simply not real. And then of course we have the other camp that they do exist, they are real. But the problem with this camp is they take it to the extreme, they see demons everywhere. So the reality is, is the Bible speaks on things like this. This is a real encounter that Jesus had in the movie, The Usual Suspects. Verbal Knit says the following, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he does not exist. Paul in Ephesians chapter six says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our real fight is against the things that we cannot see. But for those who take it to the extreme, there's this excessive focus sometimes, and maybe you've met somebody like this. They see demons everywhere, and they're the cause for everything. If you have a headache, it's a demon. If you sneeze, it's a demon. If a cop pulls you over, it's a demon. You know, you, you find a reason to blame the demons and everything, and I don't think that's an accurate picture of what the Bible teaches. This is a picture that we're going to see right now of what demon possession looks like. And just from what I read, it's not pretty. It's pretty scary. So with that in mind, let's think about the different people that we meet throughout Mark chapter 5. And let's start with the demons. Notice that the first thing is they recognize Jesus right away. Did you notice that? They had no trouble accurately describing who Jesus was. Right off the bat, as soon as Jesus got out of that boat, the man runs up to Jesus and he describes him as the Son of God. He didn't need to take a poll. He didn't have to sit down and ask him 50 questions. He knew who Jesus was. And he says, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Notice the word us as a precursor to something that we're going to find out as this passage unfolds. But the demons were accurate. They know who Jesus is. For months we went through the book of James and this was one of our major points. In James chapter 2 verse 19, he says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You see, the demons have accurate theology and sometimes that's not the case with us in fact in this very passage right before they got to that side of the lake 
to that side of the, when they got out of the boat, they were in a storm. If you go back and read Mark chapter 4, right before we get to chapter 5, the disciples were in a terrible storm on their way over. And there the disciples are scared. And it's Jesus when he wakes up, has this encounter when he calms the storm. You remember? But do you remember what the disciples said? They said, what sort of man is this? Who is this Jesus that even the winds obey him? So you see, there's this confusion even with the disciples. And there's confusion to this day, 2,000 years later, about who Jesus is. Everyone has an opinion. Just wait till Easter and you watch the History Channel. And you're going to see all kinds of opinions. But guess what? These demons know exactly who they're dealing with. This is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. They also know their final destination because they ask him a question. They say, Jesus, are you here to torment us? You see, they know where they're heading ultimately. And so they're wondering if it's that time for them. Are they gonna suffer right now? Are they gonna be thrown in the lake of fire? Is there going to be agony? They know that that's coming, but maybe they don't know when that's coming. But now Jesus, the Son of God, is standing in front of them. And so maybe they think it's Judgment Day. Now in Luke, because this story is recorded, not just in Mark, it's in Luke, and it's also in Matthew. Luke says that they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. I remember a movie a few years ago called The Abyss. I don't remember watching it, but I, remember, I, I know enough about it that it, it was something like hikers or something were going down on the earth. And it makes sense because in Greek, the word is abusos. It's abyss, and it literally means the deep. It's kind of scary when you think about it, isn't it? Right? You don't really don't need a lot of description. It's just scary enough to think that these demons know that their final destination is the abyss. And then the final observation with the demons, and this is also troubling, is that they like to attach themselves to things. Did you notice that in the story? That these demons, some reason, some way, like to attach themselves to things, but they're not inanimate. They're, they're living, notice, they're living. Because they're possessing this man, but then notice that they kind of negotiate so they don't have to go in the abyss to go into the herd of swine. They want to go from one living thing into another living thing. And one of the tricks that I, I do is I like to start the sermon early so that things like this can marinate in my mind. And all week I've been thinking about why do they attach themselves to things that are living? And this is purely conjecture, but maybe it's right, and maybe there's other things. I think it's because when you attach yourself to something that's living, you can wreak havoc on that thing. And isn't that the goal of the evil one? The evil one is to take down and ruin somebody's life. The goal of the evil one is to steal, to kill, to destroy, literally to wreak havoc on whatever they are attached to. And here you see that in this poor man's life. And then you see that in the swine because they go off a hill and into the water. Now let's think about this man that was possessed. One of the fascinating things, I just mentioned that this account is covered in Mark and Luke. It's also covered in Matthew. And as you know, sometimes in the Bible, in the gospel accounts, the writer will share the same story, but you may get different details in one gospel writer than another. Now the unbelieving world loves to take things like this 
and say, see, the Bible can't be trusted because this story is the same story. Mark was the, recording it, Luke was recording it, and Matthew was recording it. And you see, they're sharing different things. Therefore, the Bible must contradict itself. And when you actually study things like this, this actually proves the opposite. One of the things that any good officer tells you, or detective, that if they catch a handful of bad guys and they separate them and put them in different rooms and start asking them the same questions, if their story matches identical, that means they're lying. It means that they got together before the detective talked to them and they got their stories to match perfectly. But what the gospel writers are doing, they are recording the things that are important for them at the time and for their audience. It would be like today if I went to your house after church and I asked you to describe the worship service. Certainly the folks outside would share differently. You're sitting closer, you're colder, I'm assuming, than the folks inside of the car. But then the staff would also share about the service today differently. And then that would be silly for somebody to come across years later and say, well, you know, the people outside were lying and the people in the car were lying and the people up here were lying. No, nobody's lying. They're sharing their, from their perspective what happened today. Okay, And so the whole reason I'm sharing that is because in Matthew we're told that there's not just one demon-possessed person, but there's two demon-possessed people. And I say to that, wonderful. Not that people are demon-possessed wonderful, just FYI for anyone listening out there. I'm not happy about that. I'm just saying it's not a big deal. Mark just wants to focus in on this man. Or if Matthew wanted to focus in on something differently. Now, what can we learn from the demon-possessed man? Well, a lot of things. We see that he wore, he wore no, no clothes. Uh, he was in chains. He was at times shackled and he would break those shackles. You can learn a lot of things from this man of when a person is demon-possessed. He's totally lost orientation of self. There's no dignity within this man. This man has lost himself. He doesn't care how he looks. He's literally like a beast. He's lost his sanity. Notice that checks off all of the marks. Physically, he's naked, but also very strong. The Bible says that people tried to control him, but couldn't. The Bible says that he would cut himself with stones. Also, the Bible says that he was crying out day and night. Day and night among the tombs, this man would cry out. So not only was this a physical affliction, friends, it was a mental affliction. You ever watch that movie, The Burbs with Tom Hanks? Remember those, those creepy neighbors? This is kind of the vibe that we're getting from this guy. You know, everybody knew him. Everyone wanted to avoid him. Some people tried to help him and it just didn't work out so well. But this man was tormented. And then Jesus gets a little closer and he says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion scary isn't it my name is legion and he says for we are many that means that this man had many demons inside of him in fact if you study this name legion it comes from the roman military and a roman legion is filled with five to six thousand men this man says, my name is Legion, and we are many. 
I don't know about you, but that's where I pack up my suitcase, take my stuff, zip up my jacket and say, well, Legion, it was nice to meet you, but uh, I gotta get to, to the other side of the lake again. But Jesus, the star of the show, says to this man some incredible things and the encounter transforms this man in a way that's amazing. So let's walk through this. The first thing this man does is he accurately describes Jesus. He says, you are the son of God. But then he, he does something that we miss. If you go back and read the account, he says that he bows before Jesus. That Greek word is proskonino, and it means literally to bow down and worship. You know, in the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, it says that God has highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Remember when I said that these demons had proper theology? Not only did they accurately understand and name who Jesus Christ was, but the response was to bow the knee and worship Jesus. You know that that's going to be our response, just like the demons, whether we want to do it willingly or unwillingly. You know there's going to be a time of great judgment at the end of our lives and at the end of the days where we bow our knees before Jesus, whether it's willingly or unwillingly, and we pay homage to the king. And here we see it in the picture of the legion. You see, he recognized Jesus' authority. And he asks not to be sent into the abyss, but to have mercy and have these demons sent into the pigs. And here Jesus commands these demons to come out of the man. He says, go. Could you imagine being there, watching this encounter? Now, we learn something from the man. Because the story doesn't end here. Something incredible happens in the life of the man. Because the man, if you notice, is healed. He was healed. He was set right with his encounter with Jesus. And what was the effects of this man? What happened? Do you remember when we first met this man? He was out of his mind. He was physically out of control. Now we see this man sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, calm, and in his right mind. And this man wants to do nothing more but go with Jesus. In fact, the Bible says as Jesus gets up to leave, this man begs to go with him. And why wouldn't he? What would your reaction be? If you were that man living in the tombs, out of control of yourself, wouldn't you want to be with the person that just healed you and put you in your right mind? I know I would. But Jesus does something strange. He tells the man, instead of saying, sure, tag along with me, he tells him to go home. He says, go home. Not in a mean way. And some folks don't understand why he tells him to go home. And I think it's just simply this. A lot of us want to change the world, but the easiest way to do that is to go home and love our families. A lot of us want to change the world, but the easiest way to do that is to go home and start in our backyards. A lot of us want to change the world, but the easiest way to do that is to be faithful right where we are planted. 
And this is where this man was planted. The great author Voltaire said, tend your own garden. You know what that means? Start in your own yard. Start in your own neighborhood. Neighborhood. If you want to change the world, change the people that are closest to you. Start there. And so we see a radical transformation in this man's life. But then we add, and I'll conclude with this group, a component that none of us see coming. You see, we started with the demons, then we went to Jesus, then we went to the man demon-possessed. But there's another group in the story, and they are the pig herders. Do you notice their reaction to Jesus? Let me read it again. When the swine herders saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Because of course, who wouldn't? Wouldn't you? I know if I saw that, I would go out and tell everyone I know. Then the people come out and see what had happened. And when they came to see Jesus, they found the man whom the demons had gone sitting and he was sitting at Jesus' feet. He was clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. The Bible says that these people were afraid. The Bible goes on to say that they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. They wanted him to depart. You'd have to ask yourself why. Were they afraid? Why did they, did they not want anything to do with Jesus? I think it's because the economy was taking a hit. Because Jesus just sent like 2,000 other pigs into the water. So they really didn't want Jesus around anymore. But I want us to think about this as we conclude. This story starts off with Jesus getting out of a boat and a man who is demon-possessed running up to meet him. That's how it starts. Jesus getting out of a boat and this man coming to meet him. At the end of the story, this man is clothed, he's in his right mind, and he's going to tell others of the great things that God has done. But see, what's fascinating to me is the end of the story is Jesus getting back in that boat. But this time, instead of being welcomed, he's being rejected. One man Jesus went across that water for. One person. That's how important this man was to Jesus. This is another insight into the ministry of the Son of God. His great love, his great compassion, that he's able to focus in and see people and see their pain and see their struggles and meet them and save them and change them but the less obvious component of this ministry of jesus is that for every one person sometimes there's hundreds or thousands that will watch what he can do and simply reject him may that not be your case today and may those who are listening today be those like the man that will embrace Jesus and have their life changed and then turn around and go home and start to change the people's lives closest to them. May God bless the preaching of the word. Amen.